Good morning. I'm going to do some furniture arranging. Hope that's okay. Sound team. I'd like to be able to move around a little bit. Thank you for inviting me. I know Lee gave me a call and said, hey, can you come and preach? I'm away. And I want to you know, thank you for allowing me to come and be a part of your service this morning. Uh, YD and Temple so have had a long, rich history of partnership for many, many years. And we're grateful for the support uh, of, of you guys uh, that we have experienced, whether it be actually some of you prayerfully and actually partner uh, financially with some of our staff at YD and also just a long history of different outreach events and also many interns uh, have come from this church that are, have been through YD um, and some are in ministry now, some are in different parts of ministry, not in a church or, or on the mission field as such, but maybe they're actually in a mission as a teacher or on the mission field as a plumber. Uh, because we're all missionaries, yeah? No matter where we are, we're always on mission. Um, I love your new church here, your new building. Uh, and it speaks of what can come, does it not? And YD as well, we've been going through a rebuilding phase and we're excited about what is coming up for us. We have been thrust into how do we do outreach now when we can't go into a public school and talk about Jesus as openly as what we've been able to do for many, many years. And that being taken away from us was really, really, really hard. No more schools ministry in the, in the sense that we could do it. And then Blue Moose, as you, as you may know, we finished that up as well. And we had a celebration service in this very building some 18 months ago. But the Lord is on a rebuild. The Lord is on a new thing. And we've been going through a bit of a John 15 experience, I guess, the, the vine and the branches, what needs to be cut, what needs to be pruned so that there is new life. And we're excited about, we're looking to employ new staff. We're thinking, what are the new outreach programs? Our courses are being reviewed. And we've got probably, we've got about 20 students this year we look to probably double that number next year uh, and people that will come and be equipped for a life of mission. Because that's what YD is about, equipping young people for a life of mission. Um, as I said, it could be mission in a church, it could be mission out um, as a plumber, as a chippy, whatever it might be, because we're all on mission. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, update on YD. Uh, Lee said, talk a little bit about YD. So I just took his invitation to give you an update on what is happening there. Can I pray? And we'll get into what I feel the Lord has uh, got on my heart today. Father God, I thank you uh, that you are our God. Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And your Holy Spirit, you are here today amongst us. You've already been before us. And I pray that the words I speak will diminish, but your words will be what is left ringing in our ears and in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today I want to actually tell you my story, my testimony. How did Jesus, how did Jesus draw me to himself? And I want to use the story of the lost son in Luke 15. Um, and I want to walk through that. I'm not going to read the whole thing in one slab. I'm going to read that through. It'll be up on the screen. Um, and I have found that Jesus did not waste a single word in this particular parable, probably all, all his parables, he has not wasted a particular word. A little bit about my background. The first photo, please, Beth. Uh, this is me as a kid. Now, Tootie and David, you have to be quiet. Um, put up, I want you to try and guess which one am I in the photo. I'm not the one in the dress, in case you were wondering. Um, this is obviously, this is probably about the mid-1970s, roughly. Although I, I think even though that dress was fashionable then, I reckon cycles of fashion come around. I reckon you could, ladies, could you wear that today? I think you probably could. Princess Highway, is that where you'd go to get that? Are you impressed? I know that, I know that some of the shops. So put up your hand if you think I'm the one in the middle, the, the, the sun in the middle. Okay, we've got middle. Put up your hand if you think I'm the sun at the back. Okay, what about the one down the front? Oh, you're clever. You're clever. Yes, I am the youngest. I am down there with my Harry High pants, pulled up really high, and my socks and my sandals, which was very fashionable today. That I would not dress my kids in today. I would pull their shorts down, or down, you know, not quite so, not, not quite so high. Um, so that's a little bit about my family. I was brought up in a farming community, a little place called Rainbow, which probably some of you may have heard of. 
Uh, it's about, if you jump in the car, drive five hours northwest. So go towards Ballarat, go to Horsham, and then take a slight turn north instead of going to Adelaide. And there you'll find a very flat area of countryside. I'm not talking no mountains. There used to be a lake there that's really dried up now. Um, and it was sheep and it was wheat. And we had about two and a half thousand acres, which is fairly normal for that, that kind of area. We're not talking like an acre down here, it's probably worth about a million dollars in this area. So don't multiply a million by two and a half thousand because it's not quite that. It's about probably a thousand dollars for an acre up there, but you're talking like farming land. Um, and that's where I was brought up. Um, as a kid, I learned how to drive a tractor when I was about probably 10 and a ute and, the, and learned how to do all those things on, who was brought up on a farm? Anyone had farming experience, farming background yet? Yeah. So you know the kind of thing where by the time you're 18, your license is like, oh, I can get that in a flash, no worries at all. Go to a local police station, do a test, drive around the block in five minutes and you've got your license. No 120 hours today, my daughter is um, 17, she's on about 70 hours. If I had to do the hours now, I'd probably fail. Anyway, um, so you get the picture of the kind of um, place that I was brought up in. Let us read through the first part of this story from Luke 15. Um, the first part it will be up on the screen, or you can follow in your Bibles, reading from verse 11 in Luke 15. Just a little bit of background. Jesus has just told three others, two other stories. He's talked about a lost coin and a lost sheep. And in the word at the start of Luke 15, he says he's talking to tax collectors and sinners, but there are Pharisees there as well. So there's a whole mix of people that Jesus is talking to. And I reckon he was pretty deliberate in seeing who the audience was. He is covering all the ranges of the different demographics through society. And he's just given the stories of the lost coin and the lost sheep and how even the one, even the one out of so many is valuable. And I will go and find the one. And there is much rejoicing in heaven when the one is found. That, that's the background. And then he comes into the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. I'm reading uh, this from the NIV. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. <clears throat> Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I relate very much to this younger son because I wanted to leave home as well. I was, as you saw in that photo, I was the youngest of three. I'd watched my older two brothers leave home. They decided not to be farmers. Um, actually, my middle brother stayed on the farm for a couple of years, but then, but then decided, no, no, Dad, I want to check out the countryside. I couldn't wait to go. By the time I was 14, 15, I wasn't going to be a farmer. I wanted to go. I wanted to go to the city where the real life was going to be, as far as I was concerned. And let's just say I wasn't the best in terms of my language with my parents. Um, I would probably just talk to them when I wanted something. If I needed to get into town, I was on, a, on the farm, so that was about a 10 minute drive. Didn't, drive, didn't ride my bike. 10 minute drive in the country is a lot further than 10 minute drive in the city. Um, so that's, I only want to talk to my parents when I wanted to. Um, you've probably heard this said, if you've heard this story spoken of before, uh, this parable. When the son says to his dad, hey, give me my share of the estate, give me my inheritance now. Give me my share of the property. When do you normally get an inheritance? It's normally after someone has passed away, isn't it? It's not only beforehand. It's the son saying, Dad, you're as good as dead to me. I just want to take my money now and go. We don't get a lot of emotion or there's no um, pit in the story about how the father responds, but I just wonder how he would have responded when he has heard his son say to him, I want out. And in fact, that I want to go to a distant country, it says. A distant country. I want to get so far away from this place to start a new life. Just a short thought there that came up to, to myself was the power of the language in our word, the power of our words, rather. 
the tone in our words can be very, very powerful. There's a whole other sermon, and that which James, you know, the Apostle James talks about, um, which, we, we, which we could get into, but we won't. But I think that the language, the tone in my language, when I was 17, 18, wanting to leave home, when all I ever said to mum and dad was, hey, can you take me here? Can you take me there? Can you pick me up? And when it came to the day I had to leave, I, I left home, I couldn't wait to actually see the, the back of them and just start my real life down here. And I think, wow, if I had my time again, I would, I would speak much much kinder. I think as a 17 year old I didn't really get that. I wonder if the younger son here too didn't get that. He was obviously wanting to get away as far as he could, as far away from home, wanting to move away um, because he thought the real life isn't on the farm. Where was my relationship with God? Well I wouldn't say that relationship was something that characterised my faith. We were brought up going to a church I sat through many, many church services. I went to Sunday school. I did confirmation classes, which was what's happened in the Lutheran church where I was brought up. As I say to Lutheran church, I'm not denigrating Lutheran church. I just give you the picture of where I was was brought up. Um, I only went to church because I had to. Because mum and dad said, you've got to come. And there were times I probably pulled the God card and said, yeah, I believe in God. I think I'm a Christian. But did my actions really represent a Christian? No, they didn't, because I was interested in how drunk can I get without vomiting? How many girls can I pick up? And life is just about doing what I want to do. Go with the wave. I don't know where I'm going to end up in life. I know I don't want to be a farmer, but I want to go to the city where life really can kick in and have a lot of fun. Um, You know, even if I was at school, and there were probably a couple of non-believers or atheists at school who would every now and then, you know, say, oh, God doesn't, God's not real, God doesn't exist. I remember a time the Gideons came, as some of you might have had Gideons come to school, and they handed out the little New Testaments, and one of my friends tore the pages out. I said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's, That's wrong. But then the next day I'd be living a lifestyle that was far from what I said I actually believe. So I was probably pretty hi- hypocritical and I didn't even realise it. So that was me. That was me in terms of my life where I was with God. I thought I was close to God but he was, we were far apart. Far apart. Let us move on to the next part of the story. Thanks Beth. Verse 17. So the, the son has moved away. He's now out, hired himself out to a place uh, where he's feeding pigs and he's longing to fill his stomach with pig food. Pig food. Wow. Such is the place he's found himself in. So verse 17. When he came to his senses, when he realised pig food doesn't taste too good, basically. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare So people who are just servants are getting better food than what I'm getting, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. The youngest son is having a reality check. I think he's at the end of himself. The fact that Jesus said, so he, he got up. Is he, is he down, lying down on the ground? He's actually, oh, what am I doing here? What have I done? Is he, is, he, is he sitting down like this and he's got his head in his hands and he's saying, what have I done? What have I done? I've messed up. I've made a rash decision. I've made a rash choice. The Holy Spirit, the Heavenly Father, let's just say, has a way of drawing people to himself. And this is what I was starting to experience when I was about 18 or 19, after I'd moved to Melbourne. A little bit more about the son first. So we get an idea that this guy, he's realising that he's lost a bit of perspective He's realised, I've messed up here. I shouldn't have done this. Have you ever made a a rash choice? A rash decision? 
you are fixated on something you want to buy, or you go and buy it really quickly, for instance, or you say something that comes out of your mouth really quickly, and think, oh gee, I shouldn't have said that. And you can get a bit fixated, can't you? And be a bit of a rash choice. We obviously get an idea of where God is in the picture in this guy's life because he's saying, I have sinned against heaven. So there's some picture of God being part of this guy's cultural upbringing or his lifestyle. He's starting to what we would call, he's starting to show repentance. He's being convicted perhaps of what he has, he has done. So family life for him must have included something like that. Did he have a real relationship with the Lord? Well, we don't get to hear that. This is only a parable after all. Um, but I, as I said, it talks to me in the sense of, I think the Holy Spirit is starting to do a work in this guy's life as he was in, in my life. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, he says. For me, I remember when the Holy Spirit started to tap on my heart being, feeling unworthy is something that I felt and I didn't know what to do with that. Why am I feeling like this for? And we see here perhaps some confession that the son says he even rehearses what he's going to say to his dad. I'm going to go back. Is he, is he thinking, I don't know if dad's going to take me back. I've, I, I, if there was more to the story, this is the Michael, the Michael International Version, it, is he going to take me back? I, I wonder if he will. I wonder, I messed up really badly. I effectively told Dad, I don't want you. I just want your money. But now I realise I've stuffed up and I want to go back. What's, what, are the, what are the chances he's going to be happy, I wonder? I wonder if that's the kind of thing, he, if we had more of the story, that he might have been thinking. And the Lord, I think, uses circumstances to... For, he is sovereign, so he can do anything he likes. For me, what God did in my life, and maybe he did something in your life similar, who knows, everyone has their own story, the Lord started to do things in my life. And those, those experiences that I had of sitting in church where I just was deaf to what was going on, I think there were some seeds being sown in my heart that I didn't know. My mum became a Christian, born again, because she was brought up in the same way I was as well, but she found Jesus when she was in her mid to late 40s. And man, did she change. All of a sudden, she started to tell me that she loved me all the time. She, not that she didn't love me, but she started to say it more. And mum was way more interested in talking to me about God. And I thought, oh, mum, just back off. You know, I was, I was not responding too well. She would drag me along to Christian camps that were, let's just say, they weren't the average Lutheran camp um, my mum had found a whole another area of um, a Christians where, I don't know, let's just say, I would, I would tell you, the Holy Spirit was there. Let's just say there was life there. It wasn't a dead meeting of Christians. It was a meeting of a live Christian. A mum would drag me along there and I would be exposed to weird stuff. What I thought was weird then, it was speaking in tongues and it was like, oh, just weird stuff. Well, I thought was weird. Um, and I said, no, no, not, not for me. I'm okay. I believe in God. I was baptised as a month, one month old. That gets me to heaven. As long as I'm baptised as a baby and I believe in God, that's all I need to do because that's what I thought all you had to do. But I would, would go to these camps and I was, there was something going on inside of me where I kind of want to investigate this more. I'm kind of drawn to this. But I want to stay with my mates because I don't want to, you know, I, had to, I was being pulled in two directions. I want to stay with my mates because that's where the life is, but I'm kind of drawn to this. I don't want to admit to my mates that maybe I might be interested in Christianity a bit more. And I think those experiences, not many of them, started to, I don't know, bubble up inside of me. Can, you, can I give you two or three things? I could probably sit, spend, I'll give you a lot more experience, but just two or three experiences where God used different circumstances to draw me to himself when I moved to Melbourne, as I said, church wasn't something I was interested in. I lived in Burwood. If you can picture the corner of Burwood Highway and Middleborough Road, RSPCA, I lived sort of direct, directly opposite the RSPCA, uh, right on the tram tracks there. So I've just moved from the country to live on the tram tracks, effectively. Yeah, that was hard to get used to, sleeping in the morning. My bedroom was at the front of the house. Anyway, uh, that's, that's time for another story. Um, my mate I lived with, he was also from the country, we thought, we better go to church sometimes. 
because our, our parents would probably think we, we should go. So we would go along to a church in Box Hill every so often, more to, you know, get our conscience sort of, you know, feeling okay than really because we wanted to. Or we might have thought, hey, there might be some nice girls at the youth group. Uh, we had ulterior motives. So I would go along to these, this church, maybe, I don't know, once every four or five months, just put in, a, put in a, an appearance. So after I'd been in Melbourne a year, when my memory, God was doing stuff in my memory, I guess, about drawing stuff to me, I remember sitting in church one particular morning, and you may or, not, may or may not know, the, the Lutheran church is a very liturgical service. What do I mean by that? Everything is in a book, and you read out things, and the minister will respond, and you will have this back and forth going on. And it's sort of sung in minor, minor keys and minor tones and so forth. And we would say the same thing every single week. So for 18 years of my life, except probably when I was you know, three and under, because I can't remember then, we would have the service with communion once a month, and we would have the service without communion every other three other weeks. But exactly the same. And so I knew it without even looking at the book. This one particular Sunday, we were going through the liturgy, and it was like I was reading it for the first time. The words, metaphorically, were jumping off the page at me, like, is this what I've been saying all these years? And I've got to tell you, it was a really strange experience. I thought, why am I, why am I all of a sudden drawn to these words and I'm starting to actually know what they're on about? That was just a little experience I, I would have. I would find myself listening to Christian music that I'd never listened to before, probably because it had a bit of a catchy beat. Christian music in the 80s, that was sort of rock music. Well, there was, there was good and there were bad. Those who were brought up in the 80s, you know, Michael W. Smith tunes, I loved them, they were really cool. But I didn't know any about that stuff for a little while, but a mate of mine who was a Christian, his brother was a Christian, he sort of introduced me to this stuff. Well, let's just say it started to appear in my collection a bit more often, and I didn't know why. And I remember listening to one particular tape back in the day. Um, it was called Power Praise by a band called Rosanna's Raiders, which some of you might have heard of. Rosanna Palmer had this massive shock of red, frizzy hair. She basically put rock tunes to choruses from the 80s. Exalt the Lord our God. She didn't do a rock guitar, but it was a really um, slow ballad song. But I remember listening to that song one time for some reason... And I was in my bedroom in Burwood, I might have had a bit of a hard day, I might have had a girlfriend break up or something and put this song on, and all of a sudden I'm actually crying. I think, why are there tears going down my face when I'm singing Exalt the Lord Our God? I wouldn't admit, my, admit to my mates that I'm doing this, but I'm kind of enjoying what I'm doing. It's, it's, it was really weird. A couple of other things, I remember travelling on a bus, I'd go from a, on a bus from, from Box Hill Station back to Burwood, and I would, would think, I would be thinking, well, this God stuff's sort of happening a little bit. I don't know what to do with it. And I would go past a, a sign, for some reason it stuck out to me, on Middleborough Road, and there was a sign on the power pole that said, I think it said Blackburn AOG, something like that. I don't even know if it, if it was that, but I remember it as that. And I think I knew enough into the oh, AOG, I think that's an assembly of God church. Maybe I can get more of God there. Um, I did not know really what I was talking about, but I just had this desire to find more about God. And it was really, as I said, really strange to me. I did not have anyone around me, Christians, talking to me about God. One last experience I, I want to just tell you about before I move on to a bit more of the story was a night that was probably like no other in this story and what, what happened the next day. In the time when I was probably, okay, I'm all about my mates, all about getting drunk, let's go out, my mates, let's go out. So we went out to a, to a pub and they said, let's try and set Michael up with someone. So sure enough, there was a group of other friends that we had met, there were some girls there, and they said, I reckon you should get with this particular girl. So they tried to set me up, and yeah, sure enough, I was in the car going home back to this girl's house in Ringwood East. So we got back to this girl's house, it was probably 11 o'clock at night, the plan was that I was to sleep there the night. Just so you don't race too far in your head, nothing happened, okay? Nothing happened. I just thought I'd put that bit in the story so you're not on the edge of your seat wondering, I wonder what happened next, how deep I was going to get. So nothing happened. Okay, we'll go back to where I was. We started chatting, and I probably had in my head, oh, I wonder if this is going to go anywhere or not, you know, girl-wise. And then for some reason, we started to talk about religion. 
of all things. And there happened to be a, a Bible on the shelf of this, girl, of this house, on the, on the bookshelf. We pulled the Bible off the shelf. We started to look up bits of the Bible. She must have thought I was a biblical scholar or something. I knew nothing, hardly anything about the Bible. I don't know what, we, what the conversation was about, but we started to discuss bits about the Bible and about maybe faith and about religion. I probably was pulling the God card. You know, little did I know. I didn't know too much. Anyway, it got to maybe 12, 12, 30, and we thought, let's go off to bed. Separate rooms, separate rooms. So I went into a spare room, <clears throat> and to this day, I've never seen that girl again. I woke up in the morning in Ringwood East, somewhere, I had no, this is before iPhones, so I couldn't just get my location where I was. Only the Melways existed as far as maps concerned. I woke up in the morning, so this is, this is I've been 18 months now or so in Melbourne, and I had this weird feeling inside of me that said, I am not where I should be. I feel wrong, I feel dirty. God, I need you. I cannot explain it any other way except that I felt, I felt probably shame, I felt guilt. I hadn't done anything physically wrong, but something, not something, I know it was the Holy Spirit now, <clears throat> was saying, was drawing me. And I could not do anything else. So I thought, what do I do? I, I need to get to God. So I know what I'll do. I'll go to that Box Hill Church. Little did I know that I didn't really have to do that because God is everywhere. But in my very basic thinking, I've got to get to God and think God's at that church, so maybe I'll get on a train. So I found my way out of this house, found a Melways that was on this girl's shelf, looked at it, she's still in bed, I've never seen her again. Found my way to the train station, got on the train at Ringwood East, went down to Box Hill, walked down to this church. We're talking about two in the afternoon at this time. Church had closed for the day. Walked down to this church, and it's the kind of church where it had you know, the, the glass doors that would be automatic doors open, closed, but of course there was no one there. The doors were locked. I thought, oh, I can't get inside. I'll just get up as close to the glass as I can. So I literally stood there like this, face up to the doors. And in my own basic pre-Jesus understanding, I said, God, I need you. I'm sorry. I'm yours. Or something like that. And as I was doing that, I was probably half of it was thinking, what the heck am I doing? The other half of it was me, oh, how do I find this? How do I, what do I do? And the roller coaster then continued on a bit more and I was wanting to get God more and I ended up, um, the story, I could tell you more of the story, I ended up going to a Baptist church at Heathmont Baptist for many, many years and met Jesus properly, probably prayed the prayer two or three times as you might have done when you were growing up or as a, as a teenager. But God was breaking into me. Don't ever say to some people, can, God, can, can, can non-Christians hear God? Yes! Because how did we all become a Christian in the first place? People were not around me to introduce me to Jesus. Jesus did it all by himself. He doesn't usually need our help, but he, he chooses to use us. And I could not ignore the knocking on my heart that Jesus was knocking and it became louder and louder and louder. I could not ignore it. I found it very hard in the face of some of my mates who had no idea what I was going through and I felt scared to share with them because for a Lutheran to leave, to leave a Lutheran church and go to another domination is massive. It's like if Collingwood supporter became a Carlton supporter. <laughs> and that would be massive if you truly were like one of those passionate people yesterday. But that's, what, that's one of the things, that's an old enough story I could go into, but I could not ignore the knocking on your heart. Friends, if God is knocking on your heart about something, it might be something in your life, that unconfessed sin, it might be about, I don't know, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. The son here did not ignore what was happening for him. Do not underestimate the power of what the Holy Spirit can do and even sometimes fleeting thoughts that you might have Maybe have a dialogue with the Lord about that. Hey, are you trying to tell me something here, Lord? Because he wants to talk to us. No matter how long we've been a Christian, or even if you haven't been a Christian, or even, any, I don't know this crowd at all, if any of you here do not know Jesus, say to him, I want to meet you properly. Say to him, say to him. Don't ignore the knocking. 
Let's move on to a bit more of the story. The next one, thanks, Beth. So verse 20, so he's got up and he went to his father. No, just go one back, thanks, Beth. That's the one. But while he was still a long way off, so he's heading back from this distant country. We don't know how long it took him. It doesn't hear that in the story. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Wow. Remember when I, I said, what if, when the son was thinking about going back, he said, he thought, he, he could have thought to himself, I don't know if dad's going to want me back or not. I did a, I did a, I stuffed up. Well, here, if he did think that, look at the response of the father. It is the exact opposite, is it not, to what we might expect, given how he was treated. The son doesn't really get what his deeds deserved. He is lavished upon by the Father. And I love the picture the story shows of the Father still a long way off. Like I wonder if the Father is waiting for him every day. He is waiting and looking while he was still a long way off. On the farm I was brought up on, we had a long driveway, about a kilometre and a half long. I'd ride my bike to the mailbox to get the mail. Every second day we got the mail. And when we had a party, uh, my brothers were old, we'd have a 21st birthday, an 18th birthday, mum and dad's anniversaries, we'd have a big party in our big garage, 100 people would come. I would run out to the front of the house, I would look to see when is the first car arriving. I could see the dust on the gravel road coming down. I was so excited, I'd run back in, mum, dad, the first car's coming. Is the father doing something similar? He's waiting for his son every day. He wants his son back. Because the father loves his son and he wants him back. He wants him back. It's not, ha, ha, he's, he's here. I'll just let him sweat a little bit. I'll just wait here until he gets back. He can suffer a bit more. No, he does not do that. He does not do that, does he? He goes to him. They kill the fattened calf. In biblical terms, this means they put on the best bit of meat they could find. You don't kill a fattened calf every day of the week. And there's a party about to happen. Is this not a picture of what our Heavenly Father did for us? We have sinned. We messed up. The Father sends Jesus to take the penalty, to take the consequences, to take the sin. He died in our place for our sin. This is the basic message of the gospel here. The basic message of the good news, the Father loves us so much, he sends his only son to die for us in our place for our sin. Jesus rose again and we get to live with him in relationship. That's, that's the good news. The good news, it is a gift. And once we don't get to, we don't get to read it in the story, but I wonder how the son felt. I wonder how the son would have felt when he saw his dad running to him. When he saw his dad get the, the ring on his finger, when he saw the robe come out, when he heard his dad say, let's have a party, I wonder, I wonder how he would have felt. You know what it feels like sometimes when you get something that you don't really deserve? It, it kind of, you don't know how to react, you don't know how to respond, do you? I remember when I met Jesus, let's just say properly, for the first time, whether I was 19 or 20, 21, there was a range of emotions. There were tears, there was excitement, there was shame, there was embarrassment, there was confusion. There was, by and large, though, I knew something was going on in my life because I used to swear like a trooper. All of a sudden, I realised how foul my mouth was and I did not have any desire to get drunk anymore. I did not want to fill the fridge with beer anymore like I used to want it. And I thought, that is strange. Why am I noticing these things for? The Holy Spirit has come to clean me up. Do you know of Jesus or do you know Jesus? 
I sat in my church for almost 18 years thinking I knew Jesus, but I did not know Jesus. How many sermons did I hear? How many times did I know that did I, I, we had to recite the Ten Commandments in our Lutheran upbringing, had to go to confirmation? How many things did I sit through, but I did not know Jesus? Very easy to sit. I was, just like everyone here, we can sit in a church and think, yeah, I, I, I know him, but I had to confess. I, I didn't know him. I look back now, and I, I know I did not have that relationship that I know I needed now. I was starting to realise. Wow, what a response the Father has done here. Let us change tack a little bit differently here because there's another whole story going on here in the background. The next slide, thanks Beth. This is, the, this is near the end of the story. There's an older son. Can I stay up front? I also relate to the older son in this story as well. Let us read through. Meanwhile, verse 25, meanwhile the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I don't know if he used his finger or not, but it sort of seems to work. All these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, I wonder if he exaggerated a little bit there, because we don't actually hear anything about prostitutes earlier in the story, such as his anger. With prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now, I know I've probably added a little bit of drama as as I've been reading it here, but even if I was talking monotone, it's clear this guy is not happy because it clearly says he became angry. He is cut. He is thinking it is not fair. It is not fair what he has done. His brother gets all the royal treatment, yet what did he do to deserve it? I've got to be honest, I kind of sympathise with this guy. I kind of sympathise with him. Who gives him the right to get all this stuff? He's the one that come up to Dad and said, hey, Dad, I want out. He's the one that took it all and stuffed his life up. Well, why should he get it? So I kind of sympathise. I, it seems a bit funny, but I have this bit of a justice streak too. I'm driving down the Eastern Freeway during my nice, obedient, legal 100 kilometres an hour, and I see a pea platter zoom past me. Must be to 120. At that moment, I want to transform into a policeman and whip out my light and put it on my roof and chase him and pull him over and go, ha! I'm sure I'm the only one who ever wants to do that. (laughs) Because it's not fair. And I get a bit angry because he's getting away with it. And I'll probably do 102 and get booked. The brother goes on. He even says, um, you can't even give me a young goat. In today's terms, you won't even give me a sausage off the barbie, let alone a T-bone steak. Even when he says, this is where I love the deliberateness of the words of Jesus. This son of yours, he can't even say my brother. He is so angry. This son of yours has done da-da-da almost refusing to be known as being related to him. It is not fair. Well, my friends, in the kingdom, the kingdom of God, it is actually not about fair, is it? It is about grace. I heard another preacher say last year sometime, I I love the way he said it, that as As humans here on earth, we live in a democracy. As children of God, we live in a kingdom with a king and the rules are different. And sometimes we try and mess the democratic fairness of this human secular world with the kingdom of God and it's just not going to work. 
Because when we live in a kingdom with a king, the king of kings, there is a, there's a different way of living. And we use terms like countercultural or upside down kingdom. Fairness is not there. It is about grace, undeserved favour, which was lavished upon us at that cross. And the older son has missed the point, has he not? The older son has missed the point. Yeah, when he's saying to the father, all these years, all these years, dad, he's pointing out all the things that he has done. I've done this, dad, I've done this, I've done this, I've slaved away. And he's actually, I think maybe he's got an entitlement mentality. And he's actually forgotten that he's had his father's blessing all along and now he's caught up in thinking about his own deeds, about his own performance and how that should earn him the favour. And I know as I've journeyed along in my Christian life, when I've got, let's say, further along, a number of years on, when sadly sometimes the, the gloss leaves of what I've experienced when I was a young Christian and I actually had turned it into, I've got to do all these things to get to, to stay with God, don't I? I've got to have my quiet time. I've got to go to church twice a day. I've, I've, I used to go Sunday morning and night. I've got to do all these things because that's what Christians do, isn't it? I've got to, I've got to do, I've got to do. And I fall for it, thinking I need to do certain things to keep God loving me. And if I do certain things for God, I can earn his blessings. And if I don't do certain things, he's not very happy with me. Let me just say that the things I do for God, I need to keep doing. But they're the fruit of my relationship. They're the fruit of my relationship rather than the things I do to earn my relationship. See the difference? The things I do are the fruit of the relationship, not the things I do to earn the relationship. And the story here in Luke is called the lost son and it was referring to the, the younger one. I actually wonder if the older son is just as lost. I wonder if he is actually now the lost son and has he been lost all along because he has missed the point. The last slide, thanks Beth. The last couple of verses. Verses 31 and 32. The father comes in with this response. My son, this is talking to the older son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I love the way the father reminds him. And once again, Jesus did not waste words. Even he's saying, this brother of yours, he's reconnecting the relationship when the son had said, this son of yours, and he reminds him, no, no, he's your brother. He's your brother. Everything I have is yours, he says to his son. Almost like, what I have given you, son, is enough. What I've given you, son, is enough. Once again, a picture of the finished work of the cross. That was enough. There was enough done on that cross. Because of the cross, we have unrestricted access to the Father now. The curtain is torn, the veil is lifted. My access to the Father is now not on, on an Old Testament model where only once a year someone else goes in on my behalf. No, no, no. I can be with the Father 24-7 now. And every time when we, we, we do gospel training, how to do outreach training at YD, and whenever we talk about the gospel in terms of what has happened to sin, this blows my mind every time that every sin, look it up in Hebrews 9 and 10, past, present, future, it was dealt with on the cross for one, one time, one sacrifice, one time only. One sacrifice for all time, for all sin. The sin I did way back four or five years, years ago, the sin I'll do tomorrow, the sin I'll do in 15 years' time, dealt with, done, completely paid for. That's the Jesus that we serve. That is the grace that has been lavished upon us day after day after day. That is the good news of the gospel. Is it not? And Jesus left this earth, but he didn't leave us nothing. He left us the Holy Spirit for us to be counselled, to be comforted, 
to be convicted, not condemned, because that's the work of the devil, I believe, condemnation. No, we are now no longer under condemnation because we are new creations. And we have full access to the Father. And I'm still working that out every day, like all of us are here. I haven't got it worked out. I'll never understand completely the grace of God until I get to heaven. Even then, will I understand? I don't know. As I said, I find I'm working this stuff out each day about the amazing amount of grace that he has lavished upon me and that I dare not become about the older son's ways of I've got to do, 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 because if I don't, and also the younger son, hey, well, I'll just do my own thing and work it out myself. He's my creator. He knows how I tick. He knows exactly how I work. He's given me an instruction manual here. And the Holy Spirit as well will impart things to us all. There is no better, better way to live than a relationship with Jesus. Who do you relate to maybe in this story? Is it the younger son? Is it the older son? Is it the father? Maybe there's no one particular that you relate to. Or maybe you're picturing some other relationship in your family where you see this playing itself out. Whichever you relate to or don't relate to, know this one thing. My friends, Jesus is enough. The cross is enough. We do not need to add anything else in. Jesus is enough. Can I pray? As every head is bowed and eye closed, I want to give you time to talk to the Lord. Maybe even do that right now as you're sitting there. There's there things you need to confess, things you need to say. Why don't you take that time now to say, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry for insert whatever it is you need to or Jesus I need to or yeah allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart to your soul to your mind right now and I don't want to lose the opportunity here to maybe allow someone if they haven't actually met Jesus just in the quietness here with all eyes closed that if you do not know Jesus you can pray a simple prayer like this you say Jesus thank you that you love me Jesus thank you that you died on the cross for me Jesus I say sorry for going my own way I say sorry for choosing my way over your way thank you for forgiving me I ask you now to come and live in my heart through your Holy Spirit. I invite you into my life and I choose now to serve you, my King, from this day forward. It's a simple prayer that anyone can pray who, he who may not know Jesus. Or it could be a prayer of recommitting as well. You may, you may want to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you love us unconditionally, without fail, no matter what we have done or will do, you never, ever stop loving us. And we thank you for showing us the story in The Lost Son in Luke, where we get to just see a, a simple little story of a father's lavish love for a wayward son. How much greater and bigger is your love for us, that you would send your one and only son to die for us. And it didn't end on that Good Friday, as we know. It, it started again, in a sense. It restarted when the tomb was broken open. Thank you that you know exactly the way that we need to live. Holy Spirit, guide us each and every day. Provide words 
for us when we may be in a situation to talk of our faith. Provide comfort when we need it and counsel and conviction. And I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm happy to pray with anyone who wants to afterwards or you want to chat, don't mind at all. Or there might be elders or prayer teams here, I don't know how it works. I uh, encourage you, if you need to, seek out those people. Um, once again, thank you for the invitation to come and share with you this morning.